There's a blessed time that's coming, coming
praise Him and worship. We were worshiping.
pray for something, it's because he intends to answer. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. He wouldn't tell us to pray for more laborers if he wasn't going to send forth laborers and answer our prayer. Amen. amen. It's not automatic. We 
do our praying and God doesn't answer. Yeah. It's the way he's set up in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Amen. There's very little that God does apart from the prayers of his people. If his kingdom comes, it's because we pray. If his will is done, mm -hmm. it's because we've asked him for his will to be done. God is not uh, contrary to some opinion. He is not um, a bully. God is a perfect gentleman. Amen. Amen. He waits to be invited. Yes. Now he can move. Uh, but God can move when he decides to move. Sovereign moves of God happen every once in a while. But most of God's moves are cooperative moves. Amen. He works with us. We're workers together with the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're his hands. We are the body of Christ. Right. Amen. Amen. Whatever God was going to do on the earth um, when Jesus was here. It happened through Jesus. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. Yeah. And now you and I are God manifested in the flesh. Yeah. The church is God manifested in the flesh. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We are the body, the body of Christ. Amen. All right. So let's look at this prayer that God will answer. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. That's linked together with confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Your prayers are affecting a lot of people and a lot of things. And they avail much. Amen. In the NIV, that passage of scripture reads like this. Excuse me. I'm back up here. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The power of the prayer of a righteous man is powerful yes. and effective. Man. Powerful and effective. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. Everybody say he prayed again. He prayed again. He prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth their fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the soul from the error of his yeah. way shall yeah. save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Let's pray over the word of God. Jesus, I pray, I know your word is blessed, but I pray that it will go forth with power and anointing. I just pray, Lord, that you would flow through my heart, my mind, my lips, oh God, uh, my entire being, and, 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 and God, send forth your word to your people uh, and bring healing, Lord, in every area, Lord, whether it's financial healing, emotional, spiritual, physical, uh, relational healings, whatever it might be, God, you send forth your healing power. Everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. And we're going to try to <laughs> try to finish off where we started this morning. Um, this is the atmosphere that God heals in. Amen. I think that chapter 5 and verse 16 is a very powerful verse. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now we like the second part, pray for one another, is the third part, that you may be healed. Amen. But the first part isn't nearly so pleasant because everybody say vulnerability. vulnerability. Amen. If there ever were a place where we could really be real and bear our hearts and souls, it should be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 I'll tell you something, when you go to the hospital to get checked, it's a very vulnerable place. Amen? They'll ask you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. You were walking down the street. You get my drift. Amen? You become very, very vulnerable, especially uh, when you are having something serious done. Amen? The doctor, you trust the doctor? Amen? We trust doctors. If we could trust Jesus like we trust the doctors. Amen. Amen? And spiritually and emotionally make ourselves vulnerable. But we have learned to erect walls around us. We have learned to do that, to protect ourselves. Amen? Yeah. We do that. We all do it. And I can see walls very, very easily. Yeah. Amen? I see walls. <laughs> I see them in the natural. I see them in the spirit. And, and we all do it. I've done it. You've done it. We're all guilty of putting up walls. But the Bible says that we've got to knock down the walls and we've got to have an atmosphere in the church of vulnerability and openness and transparency. 
Confess your faults one to another. So the atmosphere where healing can take place is an atmosphere of trust. Amen. Number one, if you're taking notes, number two, the transparency. Trust and transparency. When you trust, then you become transparent. Now, I'm looking forward to getting to know many of you on a, on a deeper level, more than just praise the Lord. How are you doing? Great. How are you doing? Great. And that's fine. That's small talk. But um, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring an environment where healing takes place. Small talk is not where healing takes place. It's when we bear our souls onto another. Remember the first time we were part of a house group in uh, Fredericton, we were attending Capital Community. We were there for um, over a decade, almost a decade and a half, I believe. And uh, we were uh, part of the church and involved, quite involved in different areas. And uh, anyway, they started doing some, um, I guess they were called cell, like cell meetings, where you have the church split up into groups and we had maybe, um, I don't know, 15, 20 people that met in a home. And I remember how tense it was. Oh my goodness. It was so tense. It was so tense. And you know why it was tense? It was because we're not used to being open and personable. You know, we think fellowship is coming to church and sitting in the pew behind somebody and looking at the back of the head. Hey, saints, that's worship time. That's not fellowship. Fellowship generally happens before service and after service. It happens in homes. It happens in small groups where we can... We can be open with one another. That is fellowship. And sadly, sadly, it is, it is lacking in the church today. People seldom visit. People seldom are in the homes of others. Sometimes we have a favorite one or two that we will hang out with when we get a chance to break away from our busy schedules. I don't know how people in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s ever found time, but it seemed like they, they had more work Less automatic this and that, Mike, no microwaves, uh, ringer washer machines, and people took time. And maybe it was a simpler day, a less pace, but people actually visited. I remember people being in our home. And it was always a delight when somebody came by to visit. It lifted your spirits. And uh, you know something? A church that is going to have revival and a harvest is that kind of a church. Yeah. You say, well, I don't just like people dropping in uninvited. Well, sometimes there's there's a time maybe when you don't. But I think that we should always have the door open for ministry. Yeah. Amen. And if you're not real, real, real super comfortable, um, there's a, a great place that you can do ministry for the Lord. It's called Tim Hortons. <laughs> it's, I know it's a place of great gossip as well. But you know what? You can, you can use that for the Lord. And I've heard of people teaching Bible studies and winning people to the Lord through, you can have a Tim Hortons ministry if you don't want to open up your home. <laughs> amen? Can you say amen? How many of you want to stand in line for, for a Tim Hortons ministry? You think I'm joking. I'm, being, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. God wants you and I to have personal relationships with people. Amen. And it starts with trust and transparency. We've got to drop the walls and stop being afraid of one another. You say, well, I shared something one time with somebody that I trusted, and they blew my cover. They blew, they blew, they, they spoke about it. Yeah. It's probably happened to every single one of us. And we probably, if the truth be told, have been guilty of creating a climate where people are afraid to open up. Now, I'm not suggesting that you talk to whosoever will in the church or outside of the church, but... Let's talk about the church because we can't fix anything out there. We can only fix things in here. Amen? Amen? I'm not suggesting that you trust everybody, but find out there are people who can be trusted in the body of Christ. And there are people who cannot be trusted in the body of Christ. Amen. Jesus had an inner circle of Peter, James, and John. Why did he tell them things, show them things, share moments with them that he didn't with the others? And when he came down off the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, oh, by the way, boys, don't tell anybody what you've seen until after I'm risen from the dead. And they didn't have a clue what he was talking about, raised from the dead. But they did respect his wishes, and they kept it in confidence. Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. We need an atmosphere of trust, and we need, that's got to come first. You say, well, how do you trust? First of all, you learn to discern. You learn to discern. Yes. You learn who you can trust. And I hope, I hope you can trust me. I hope you can trust my wife. I can guarantee you that you can. Amen. Amen. But I'll be honest with you. 
No, I won't. I'll be honest, but I won't say what I was thinking. <laughs> when in my younger ministry was out one time with a, a dear man of God, his name was Jack Long. You remember Brother Jack Long? Amen. A good, Amen. kind man of God. And we were going somewhere. I was with his family. I was like their fourth kid at the time. I was 19, and that was eight. I mean, we're talking about way in the olden days. Amen. Shane was uh, Shane was three, a little towhead, shock of blonde hair, almost white, and and Rick was about five or six. And I got to enjoy several things in their home. It was very interesting. <laughs> Especially when they misbehave. <laughs> I don't know if anybody in the Long family is watching, but I got to know them real, real well. And I got to find out that they were true blue people, and you never heard them criticizing the saints of God in their home. One time we were out at an outing somewhere, we'd stopped by a community where there was another pastor, I won't say where it was, but somewhere between the North Pole and the South Pole. <laughs> And uh, this preacher and his wife, well, we met up with them and they got into conversation. Well, it really was a one-sided conversation. And they were talking about this one and they were talking about that one. And I'm thinking, what? Yeah, amen. But I never ever heard that in the long household. They were discreet, they were professional, they were responsible, they were trustworthy. And so I'm just saying that sometimes you may have been hurt at one point by a preacher who betrayed your confidence. It may have happened. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect, none of us are, but I tell you one of the most important things to me is if I share something in confidence, that it is kept in confidence, amen? amen. <clears throat> so you learn to discern, and then you learn how to, who to trust. Because if God's gonna heal some broken hearts in this place and beyond these four walls, we have to be a community where we can trust one another. Yes, sir. And we have gotta be transparent, amen. and that comes as a result of trust. Amen. When you can trust and you can open up. And it's very wonderful sometimes to dump a burden, to pour it out before somebody. They say a burden shared is half a burden. And a joy shared is double the, the joy. And I believe that that is where fellowship comes in. And the early church continued in the apostles' doctrine and in prayer. And I think we've got the doctrine down. And I think, I think we all pray. I really do believe we pray. Uh, but fellowship and breaking of bread is the other two parts, the social aspect to us having revival. It's not just God. We have our part to play, amen? We've got to be connectors. And I've always, I always find it really interesting that when you're in a mentor situation, you get to find out who the organizers are and who the connectors are. Because there are your planners, the people that work behind the scenes. They're really great with details. They're not necessarily um, really, really great connectors, but they get things done. And it's really important that, to have them in the church, the people who love to plan. And they usually get stressed out <laughs> working with people who are connectors. Because you've got your connectors who just are out there and making things happen in relationship, but not we're not always, I'll put myself in that category because I'm probably more of a connector than, my wife is a great organizer, amen, but she's a little on the shy side, so she might ask me to do something for her that, <laughs> If, if she's, but she's actually become a lot more assertive. I think working out in the world has helped her so much. And I've always said that people in ministry, everybody should have a secular job, at least for part of your ministry, to learn how to work with the world and to learn how to, because there's a lot you can learn in the world. It's not all bad. Amen. There's a lot of great people that you can learn from. And so it's really brought her out of her shell tremendously. And, um, but she's the more organized and I'm more the connector. And sometimes planners get a little frustrated uh, with, with, with connectors because we don't always see all the details or we may forget about some of the things that need to get done and need to be reminded. But it is important, we're talking about connection tonight, so let's leave the organizing. Generally, that's pretty good at most churches. You have your organizers. But connectors, people that are good at introducing people to the Lord, Introducing people to other people that can help them, it is so important. And you know what? Sometimes I know I'm probably overly transparent and my wife gets a little nervous. She said, you don't have to tell everything about our lives. I said, but they seem to be listening with, uh, with interest. I'm holding their attention. But you know, I really can't change 
a whole lot. I really, I, and I'm not gonna try to change to suit everybody because that's who I am. I am a connector by nature. I love people. Amen. I love being around people. Amen. Even odd people. Odd people that can be very interesting. <laughs> I just find all people interesting. You can learn something. What was it Jackie shared with my wife here recently? She said, so, <laughs> so some people are wise and some people are otherwise. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. Amen. Honestly, I believe that if we can't laugh at church, there's something wrong. If we can't, if we can't enjoy ourselves, you ought to enjoy being in the house of the Lord. You ought to enjoy worship. You say, well, it's for God. Don't you think God wants you to enjoy worshiping him? It's a pleasure to worship the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. I love worshiping God. Hallelujah. I worship God everywhere. Amen. 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 I love to I love to praise God. Because it brings his presence. Yes, sir. Amen. It brings me into connection with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't stay saved without worshiping God. Amen. I mean, I got the Holy Ghost to worship. I keep the Holy Ghost to worship. My relationship with him. That's the only thing I can give him that he doesn't already own. All the silver and gold, including your bank account. <laughs> Except if it's overdrawn. He doesn't own that. <laughs> but he owns it all. Amen. We gotta be, we gotta connect. We come here to connect with God. I, yes. I'm serious about getting something from God while I'm here. Yes. Sir. Amen. And, and it's important because I'll tell you something I've noticed is that uh, People who win people to the Lord are worshipers. Amen. You know, you're opening yourself up. You know, just take a moment and look at the, right. look at the inner healing here. For, let's right. have some fun first. You talk about the body language when we worship the Lord. Now, see, for us, we're so comfortable lifting our hands and praising the Lord. Some people probably think we're so odd. How can you do that in church in front of everybody? You know, lift your hands. Well, really, it is a vulnerable position. I mean, it's a position of surrender. You're opening, you know, when somebody is not comfortable, they generally fold their arms. That body language tells you something. They will, if they're sitting on a chair and they're, and you're here, and they're, they're kind of like sitting this way, that body language tells you something. Amen. I know a counselor, a very good counselor. He says, uh, he has a couple of chairs set up in his uh, office where he counsels couples and one of them is a love seat, and then there's a couple of other seats. He says he knows they stand a chance of getting help if they sit together. But he knows it's a warning sign when she sits over here and he sits over there. Body language. It tells, it tells 90%, 90% of what we communicate is nonverbal. And when we lift our hands to the Lord, we're making ourselves open and vulnerable. We're really saying, I surrender. When the cop says, stick up your hands, he's not just doing that to get you to praise the Lord. He's saying, you better surrender. Amen. You're surrender. You're showing that you got no weapons. You're not resisting. You're yielding. That You're letting the authorities have their way. Yes. And so when I lift my hands in church, I'm telling, I'm, I'm telling something to God that, Lord, I'm submitted to your authority. I, I, I want your will to be done in my life. Amen. Amen. Some of you haven't lifted your hands yet tonight. I think it's important. Amen. Amen. Lift your hands in the sanctuary, the Bible says. Praise the Lord. It's showing God. So that, that, that trust, that openness, that transparency, Amen. it's good to show your feelings to God. Amen. Even if you're upset. You read the Psalms. David wasn't always happy with God. He wasn't always happy with life, but he was transparent with God. Number three, uh, the atmosphere where inner healing takes place is a place of humility. Amen. The number one reason why we're not transparent is because we're proud. We're protecting ourselves. We want to look good. We don't want anybody to know that we ever struggle. Hey, I struggle. I struggle once today. 
Maybe once or twice, I don't know. It's all right. I remember a girl at, at, uh, at, uh, in university, she was talking to another girl in university. This other young lady was trying to be strong. And she said, it's good to be strong, but she said, you don't have to be strong all the time. You don't have, look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to be strong all the time. You don't. You can be weak. You can be vulnerable. In fact, I tell you, if you can be vulnerable with the right people and with God, it'll actually make you stronger. It's important. Paul said, I glory in my weaknesses. What are you talking about, Paul? That doesn't fit into 21st century ideology. You glory in your weakness? Yeah, because that's where I really depend on God and God's power comes rushing into my life. It's all right. And then let me say this to you wives. You're what, I got your attention now. It's all right to walk up to your husband and say, I need a hug. Amen. Have you ever done that? Amen. I'm sure you have. Have you ever said to your husband, I need a hug? Well, he should just know. Maybe he's really dumb like most men. <laughs> Maybe you've got to tell us what you need. Don't get frustrated. Communicate. I need a hug. I heard this one the other day. I don't know if I was sharing this with you or not. It says not to say we need to talk. Because <laughs> that'll, that'll put him at, on the defense so fast. Those walls. Go. But if you say, could, could we just talk about this for a couple of minutes? Can we just take a couple of minutes and talk about this? Then he'll think, okay, it's not going to be eternal. It's not like purgatory. <laughs> I will actually survive this conversation. Amen? Men and women are so different, aren't they? We really, really, really are. And God was so smart putting us together. Because if the men, the world would have completely run by men, it would be, it would be so. Well, the word, uh, the word comes to my mind is doorknobs. It would be just like a world of doorknobs. But if the world were just run by women, and some people think that that would be a wonderful thing, I'm just like, where's the exit out of here? I think we need. One another in the, in, the, in the body of Christ. Amen. Thank God for our godly women. Thank God for our godly men. But let me, let me just, I feel the Holy Ghost prompting me right now. You say, right in the middle of comedy hour, yeah, God can prompt me anytime he wants. Right in the middle. I, aren't you glad it's not like this morning? That was tough. You think you had a hard time? I had a hard time. I had to deliver that this morning. But anyway, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, we have a good name out there, but I just maybe wasn't lucky. But I'll let you know the next couple of people I run into that talk about our church, I'll let, would you like to know what they say? Amen. Or would you prefer not know? If you're running a business out there, and now this can't be compared to a business on uh, many levels, but in some ways it can be, would you want to know why people aren't coming through your doors? Amen. Or would you rather just keep your head in the sand and say, well, we're not making any money over here, so we're just, that's just the way it is. I think you would want to know how you could improve. And I can tell you something. Church is God's business. Yes, sir. And it is a business. Yes. And I don't mean a financial business, but it is a spiritual business. Amen. I came on business for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, sir. Amen. And if I thought for a moment that I could change in some way, to improve myself and be a better leader, I would, I would enlist. You know what Brother Carter told us? He told us this yesterday. We, my wife and I have been so busy the last little while between unpacking boxes and taking care of stuff. And we went to an equipped conference, and next year we hope to bring uh, a good team from Abundant Life to be there. It was wonderful. We hope to be able to take you there and pay for your hotel and pay for your meals and, uh, and have you stay overnight and enjoy these wonderful sessions. We had Dr. Clay Jackson, a, he's a, I believe a psychologist, very funny one by the way, uh, but very, very good. And then we have uh, Steve and Sherry, he and his wife, uh, Jana, and uh, then there was um, Stephen and um, 
Sherry O'Donnell, who passed her in Burlington. And um, it, they're, they're just amazing people. The, the psychologist said his wife, he has two medical practices going, a very busy man, and they're planning a church. And they've got, was it two or three children? Did they give one away at the conference? They have two? Three. They have three. I didn't see the third one. <laughs> he offered to give them away. <laughs> He's a busy man. He loves his kids. But anyway, um, brother and sister O'Donnell took the church about 10 years ago. 10 years ago? In Burlington. It's a suburb of Toronto, in case you're not familiar with that geography. And there was 24 people there. And today... They are running about 250 people. It's, I watch them on Facebook, I follow them, and it seems like every week, here's another one been baptized. Here's, a, here's another two or three got the Holy Ghost. It's explosive revival. Do you believe that God is a respecter of persons or places or pastors or churches? Do you believe that God just favors some people? No, there's a reason why. Uh, the church that he had worked in under the leadership of Brother Chester Mitchell, he and his wife were in Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, I believe. And uh, that church, when they joined it, uh, they were there 17 years, but they went in day and week, or sorry, in year two, there was about 22 people. That church is now running 700. It was when they left. Yes. An exciting, positive, unbelievable church. Yes. Anyway, they shared with us a lot of wonderful things, and I think it's so important that we give our, our, our team members, those that are leaders, and um, say, what do you have to do to be a leader? Well, you've got to have a positive attitude, number one. We will not have any leadership in this church without a positive attitude. If you are positive, you'll be positive across the board. Can you say amen? amen. You've got to be positive. You've got to be faithful. Yes. Amen. You've got to be a true leader. A true leader shows up early and leaves late. Amen. That's the way it is with leaders. Amen. So these are the kind of people we're looking to take a team there. But anyway, Brother uh, Carter, uh, who is our district superintendent, a wonderful, wonderful, principled man. Let me say this. I haven't always agreed with him. He hasn't always agreed with me. But one thing we agree on is a mutual. there's a mutual respect there. I respect this man. Why do you say that? Well, I just don't want you to think for a moment that, you know, I always agree with everybody. I don't. I love, I love and I respect this man. I might not do everything the same way he would, but he wouldn't do everything the same way I do. But it's wonderful to be able to have differences and still respect, amen? amen. Some people can't do that. If they disagree with you, they disrespect you. Automatic, it's just the way it is. You've gotta be wrong if you're different. You know? Different doesn't necessarily mean right or wrong. Different just means different, amen? Look at your neighbor and say, you're different. And why is it we think that's a negative thing? Because, because we are right and different is wrong. Right? That's why we take it as a negative. If you're different, that's a good thing. Amen. I'm glad I'm married to my wife. She's different. Amen. Amen. I believe that a man cleaves to his wife. Praise the Lord. I believe that's God's purpose. But well, Brother Carter, he was pastoring in the Miramichi at the time, and he shared this with us. He asked his team members, that's the people that show up early and stay late, and they're positive, and they're, they got a great work ethic, and they, and, they, and they believe in working together, cooperating. He asked them, he said, I want you all in this, it was like a retreat they had. I think they went somewhere and they stayed overnight. He said, I want you all to tell me five areas that I can improve in. And he said it was dead silence. Yes. It was just so awkward for the longest while. And then finally, he said, after about 10 minutes, somebody gave an idea. And he, then he said, I couldn't get him stopped. <laughs> he said, it hurt. It hurt. But he said, I wanted to improve. And I thought, what? That's a leader. That's a leader. That's like, you know, you saying to your wife, honey, is there any area that I could change that would make you happier? 
Now, just be ready to catch her before she falls. How many of you have that kind of a relationship of transparency in your marriage where you can say, is there anything that I could do or not do that would make you happy? Amen. And think about just a few little things. Is this good teaching tonight? Amen. I tell you, it would be wonderful for you not to have to ask. But if they came and said, and, 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 and vice versa, husband to the wife, sometimes these little things that you think are, are, are just nothing that you might do occasionally might really, really bless him. Amen. It might be getting his slippers. Yes, sir. It might be, I don't know, drawing the bathroom. It might be, a, it might be a, just kind little things. It doesn't have to cost money. It doesn't have to be difficult. But how many know that, you know, maybe we start with the positive things first. <laughs> what are the five things that I do okay. Amen. that bless you? I know not everybody's married. Not everybody's, as the Paul says, bound. <laughs> Paul says, if you're, if you're bound to a wife, he said, seek not to be loosed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Paul had a great picture of marriage. <laughs> Bondage is like going to jail. Like stocks and bonds is it? Anyway, maybe that's why he was single. <laughs> Have you ever thought? Anyway, but it takes humility, doesn't it? It takes humility. And uh, humility is a wonderful trait when you can say, you know, I may be wrong, but this is how I look at it. That doesn't make you a lesser person in other people's eyes. That creates an environment where we can be real and where we can make mistakes. It was funny because I was had to deal with my son. He, he uh, was picking up a bike, his mom's bike. He drove it to the gym and locked it up there. And then the weather was bad and they got a ride back and couldn't put it in the vehicle. He had to go get the vehicle, the, the bike. Do you want to hear the story? Well, I'll just wait till next week to share with you. Any of those people here? <laughs> I'm going to share some of the secrets. Okay. So he, the, he took the van. And I kind of told him, you know, just use it if you need to go to work. But he took it, and it was a rainy night. They went over to the gym and picked up the, the bike, and he's back into a black car. It didn't do a lot of damage, but oh my, was he shook up. My wife is so smart. She didn't, she waited until after the service this morning. Uh, we were, I think, did we have lunch yet? Was it after lunch or before lunch? Because she knew that my blood sugar would get up after we had dinner and I'd be feeling better. So she shared it with me right before I was ready to eat what happened. And so I, I had to call Newton. And she reminded me what I almost did when I was back in that 26-foot U-Haul <laughs> into our new place. I had my, my two-year-old uh, two vehicle sitting there parked way, way back. And if I'd been back in the van, then I would have had lots of room. But I slipped my mind, tired as I was, with all the packing and everything, that uh, there was a vehicle, and I was gonna try to get as close to those steps. And I heard this little voice. And then the neighbor was out working on his mini home at the same time, and he says, stop! He hears her hollering, and he sizes up the situation, and he knows I'm about ready to back into my car. I said, thank God for angels. That's an angel right there. And the neighbor crossed the street. And I got out and I took a picture of it. And I'll show you tonight if you want to see it. I came two inches from the front of that vehicle. And why did I tell you that story? I have no idea. Oh. She reminded me that I've done the same thing or almost done the same thing with the vehicle. Amen. Everybody say humility. Amen. Amen. Now you know pastor's humble. At least trying to be. Confessing faults. Well, I didn't sin against them, so why should I confess? Well, it's about being vulnerable and being open and letting people know that you don't have it all together. You say, well, how is that going to help me spiritually? You know something? If you and I appear too perfect, 
to the world we're trying to reach, they're going to say, phony. Yeah. Yeah. People are going to spot a phony. You know, you can actually try so hard to be a good witness that you can actually blow your witness by being too rigid, too... It's all right to be human. It's all right to say to somebody, you know, I struggle sometimes with my faith. That can provide an open door for you to reach through to somebody who has no faith whatsoever to let them know you are a human being. And that humility, that honesty, that brings us to a place of repentance. And I will tell you right now that I repent every day. I'm not out going committing any of the great immoral sin or lying or stealing or, you know, being abusive or anything like that. But I keep my repentance experience. You know, you could be pointing the finger at other people, but why don't we just look inside and say, God, what needs to change in here? What do I need to do differently? God, help me to grow. You can't change them. Why are you so focused on other people? Focus on yourself, Jesus said. Get that little two by four out of your own eye. Don't worry about the speck of dust in somebody else's eye. Is that what Jesus said? Yeah. He said, you confess your faults. Trust, transparency, humility, repentance, and accountability. Accountability is important. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes, I mean, I wouldn't think of being away and not telling, you know, maybe some, I don't know, I... I really don't know the track record of others who have been in leadership here, but I'm just telling you from my viewpoint, because I'm not comparing myself to anybody else, but if I'm going to be away, you're going to know I'm going to be away. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be accountable. And generally, we let you know who's coming. We're going to bring somebody in. Sometimes I forget, because I'm just living in the moment. <laughs> forget to, uh, to announce we're having the POs. Thank you, Brother Jake, for announcing that. The P.O.s are going to be here, Brother and Sister P.O. on Sunday night. They are amazing soul winners, amazing connectors. I love these people to death. They're awesome. They're just some of the greatest Christians. And God's used them supernaturally to raise up his work mm -hmm. in places and turn things around. They're amazing leaders. But sometimes I, uh, I'm a, but if I'm not going to be here, I'm going to be, I'm going to let you know. It's courtesy, and I appreciate I got some messages today. Brother Kirk is not feeling well. He was heading to outpatient. I don't know the situation. Brother Raymond is the same way, not feeling well, not here. And generally, there's a reason, and usually people will communicate. And I believe that in a church, we need to be accountable. We don't just show up like, you know, we just breathe in like whenever we feel like it. We should be faithful every time the doors are open, unless we're work or at sick or we're sick or at work. We should be here in the house of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. This might be old-fashioned to you, but I cut my teeth on this kind of Christian living. Amen. You just are in the house of the Lord. You are faithful. Amen. You support the church amen. every way that you can. You try to be involved and do something, big or little, it doesn't matter. Amen. But just do something for God and his kingdom. That's part of being a Christian. Amen. amen. I would expect that from myself regardless of whether I was in position here or not. I want to be involved. Because I love the work of God. I want to do whatever I can to move the church forward. Even Amen. if it's just move the church forward an inch. Amen. Amen. And I see I'm never going to get through this. It's going to be a little bit of a series. But at least we can have some fun. Accountability. Also, in an environment where we confess our faults one to another. Because if we don't get one, there's no point in us even discussing Number two and number three, pray for one another that you may be healed. We've got to get the environment right. An environment where you can confess your faults to one another is an environment of trust, transparency, humility, repentance, accountability, and compassion. You're not going to do this if you feel that when you bear your soul, you're going to meet judgment. If you're struggling, I would rather know you're struggling so I can pray for you. So I can encourage you. It may be an area that I've struggled myself. And I don't think it's important for us to tell all the areas where we have struggled. It really isn't important is that we walk in victory. And when somebody does come to us, that we're able to uh, uh, address them with compassion. Because people need healing in the world. They're coming in from a broken world. 
The majority of people are coming from broken relationships. You say, well, where are they? Well, maybe we had some. Maybe you didn't notice. You don't know all the ins and outs of people's lives. But I can guarantee you that about 80, 90% of people that walk in here are broken. They are broken. They are hurting. They're discouraged. They're depressed. Amen. And we need compassion. Yes, sir. And you can't fake compassion. You really can't. You either have it or you don't. If you don't, you've got to pray, God, give me compassion. Jesus Amen. was moved with compassion Amen. and he healed the sick. Yes, sir. God's not going to heal inner healing or outward healing until the church has compassion. Lord, move me. Move me with compassion. And then prayerfulness, pray for one another. You know, in that right environment, you could pray the simplest prayer. God touched them and healed them. I remember that lady that was healed of the migraine headache. She was, in the name of Jesus, I take authority. I don't remember how I prayed, but I just remember praying a simple prayer and God giving a dramatic yes, answer. Amen. Because you don't have to pray dramatic prayers to get dramatic answers amen. if the environment is right. Amen. She knew that was a word from the throne of God. Yes. She stepped up there in faith and God healed yes. her. And he transformed her life. Prayerfulness is important. And last of all, restoration. <laughs> We're about restoring people. Yes, sir. We're not about judging them. Amen. We're not about kicking them when they're down. Amen. We're about lifting people up. Yes, sir. I tell you, if God forbid that it should ever happen, <coughs> that the person that you love and trust was unfaithful to you, God forbid that it would ever happen. But if it ever happened, the greatest, you know, the greatest thing you could do for them would be to forgive them. Amen. The greatest thing that you could do for them would be to forgive them. Yes, sir. Now I know that you'll need counseling. I know that you'll need you'll need to work on the relationship. You'll have to rebuild that trust. I know that just because you forgive doesn't mean that trust is there. But we're about restoring. Amen. I think about preachers. I know some preachers that have fallen fallen away from the message and fallen in a sin. Amen. It breaks my heart. That's right. Amen. If I see them, I want to love them. Amen. That doesn't mean you're agreeing with what they did. It means you're agreeing that they're worth restoring. Yes, sir. I believe in restoration. Amen. I believe that Jesus lived that. Yes, he was restoring people. The Bible says, let him that is spiritual restore such a one. Your spirituality is tied into how restorative you are to people. Amen. A spiritual person restores. Yes, sir. He said, you really expect us to be Christians, to act like Christians. Yeah, I do. Because yes, I expect it out of myself. I expect it out of myself. <coughs> I really do. And I expect it out of you. I expect us to be Christians. I expect us to be loving Amen. and understanding. Amen. And instead of pointing the finger, lend a hand and lift somebody up. Amen. I talked with brother and sister O'Donnell. I was so impressed. I went to Bible college with him. I never would have dreamed he was a great young man. But I never would have dreamed he would be pastoring one of the greatest Pentecostal churches that is thriving. I never would have dreamed. But I, I, I spoke with, with him and I spoke with her and I, I come to find out that here's what they do. They said, you know, in any church, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. How many know that's true? 
20% of the people do 80% of the work. What they did was they found out who the 20% were. And he said, I've got some homework for you pastors. There was all kinds of saints and pastors, pastor wives and you know, all kinds of people from churches. There's a lot of churches brought their teams in. It was wonderful. He said, your homework pastors is to go back and find out who your 20% are. He said, so if you've got a church of 100, that would be 20 people. If you've got a church of 50, that would be 10. Find out who those 10 people are. And I think I've got it figured out. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, that's subject to change at any point in time. But he said, you pour into that 20%. He said, you, you love everybody? But he said, you don't spend the bulk of your time with the 80%. You spend the bulk of your time with the people that are going to move things forward. Amen. Jesus spent a lot of times with the crowds, but most of the time with his 12 disciples, training them, encouraging them. And you know what Sister O'Donnell told me? She said, what we did, she said, we just told them, you can do it. You've got it. You're, you're, God's going to take you. At, you're only 20, and you're farther along than what I was at 20. And by the time you're my age, you're going to be way beyond me. You say, well, don't you lose control as a leader? No. You encourage people. People will be loyal. Can you say amen? Amen. You, you encourage. You criticize. You're not going to have a following. You encourage people greatness in people. You tell them that they can do it. And you give them a job and you let them do it. Yeah. You let them do it. You let them make some mistakes. And you're there to help them and to, and to guide them and get them back on track when they're off. And that's what happens. And the 20% will take care of the 60%. That leaves 20%. Doesn't anybody that's a math expert out there and the 60% will take care of the 20%. Now, you reach out to everybody. You love everybody. Amen. Amen. Now, don't want anybody to misread me. If you're, a, if you're a person, well, we visited a couple of seniors today. Actually, probably three, four. Okay. And you can do a lot of good, sometimes even five, ten minutes, or even an hour. You can do a lot of good. You can do a lot of encouragement. And I do it. Listen, I'll tell you something. I'm not just doing it to get people on board or on our side. I just do it because I love it. Yeah. If I come by your place, it's because I want to be there. Yeah, sure. I enjoyed conversation today. I really did. I learned several things. I love talking to intelligent people. I do. I just love having intelligent, I should say I love having intelligent conversations. Not every, you don't have to have a, your PhD to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. But I like talking to, let me tell you something. <coughs> Small minds talk about people. Average minds talk about things. Great minds Talk about ideas. If you like talking about people, if that's your thing, uh, then you're small. Yeah. You're small. Yeah. It's all right to talk about things or whatever, but honestly, I believe God wants to lift our mentality to a higher level. Because God is calling each and every one of us to be leaders. We are being called by the Lord. God's enlisting us in his army to go forth with healing in our hand. You say, well, I'd love to have healing in my hand. Well, can you control your mouth and make sure that there's healing in your mouth, that what you say is uplifting and encouraging? Say, so, Pastor, give me some scripture. I've given you scripture. I've been here for almost three months. And you've, you've basically seen all there is to see. Now don't get bored, because I'm telling you stories. Embarrassing myself, I'm losing my train of thought up here. But basically, you've seen all that there is to see. 
God will give more messages. There'll be more thoughts, more, more things. God's going to take us. And as our church grows spiritually, we've got to grow spiritually first before we get into miracles. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want God to multiply us right yet. I don't think we're ready. Say, oh, Brother Gallon, you mean to say nobody's going to get saved and get the Holy Ghost? Yeah, people will be, but we're not ready yet. There's some mending, there's some healing, there's some brokenness right here. Why would we go out to reach broken people, Brother Vaughn, when there's broken people right here? Why would we do that? Why would we try to get other people straightened out when maybe God needs to do some straightening out of me and you? Maybe there's some areas of faithfulness. You know, God's going to build on this foundation. This foundation better be solid. It better be strong. Yeah. Amen. We're, we're, we're a vehicle to bring people to heaven. Yeah, sure. We better make sure we've got a safety inspection and that this vehicle is solid. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's got a, your, your vehicle may have some scratches on it, but you better have safety inspection. It better be road worthy. And this church has got to be revival worthy. God's not going to bless five loaves and two fishes that are moldy and rotten. I'm not suggesting that's the case here, but I'm just telling you that God will start with the good and God will multiply and the numerics will happen automatically. We saw our last church and I, I said I wasn't going to do that talking about the last church, but we saw that church triple. But the thing that excites me is not the finances or it's not the numbers, so those are important in the work of God, but it's the spirituality. Yeah. It's that there is a loving, kind, you cohesive, unified church. Yes, sir. When we went there, a backslider told me he was just, he was backslid. He sat in the back row. He said his sister so-and-so came back and filled him in the garbage of this one and that one. That happened in that church. Why do people do that? Why are people so stupid? Yeah, amen. Amen. It did. I didn't turn that church around. God turned that church around. Yes, amen. God healed that church. Yes, sir. Amen. And they're right, they're growing. Amen. Things are rolling along. Right. Amen. And there are new people just since we've left new people coming. Tell me. And it's going to continue because the foundation is right. The Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? We're out of luck. If the foundation isn't right, the foundation has got to be right. Amen. Amen. And we want this to be an environment where people can get healed. And if we could care about spiritual restoration, we would see physical restoration. We see bodies healed. It's easy for Jesus to say to the paralyzed man, rise up and walk. But spiritual, emotional things. Everybody say the whole gospel to the whole world by whole people. What's wrong with that? That's what God wants. I haven't even... Let me just say this. I heard this story yesterday. It's powerful. Some people have heard so many negative words spoken into their lives that they are wounded and scarred so badly. You know, there's a beautiful story about a young boy. I won't tell you his name yet. You know that when he was in elementary school, he could not read. And you know, one day they, he brought a note home from his elementary school teacher and she told the young man, give this to your mother. He came home, he handed, his mother the note and his mother took that note and she opened it up and she read it and when she read it tears filled her eyes and the young man said mom what does that note say she looked down at him and she said Albert your teachers can no longer teach you you're so smart they can't tell you anything that you don't know and she said the note says Albert that you're going to change the world after his mother's death, Albert Einstein found out what the note really said. The note said, Albert is too dumb to learn anything. He is never going to amount to anything. 
So today we have Pauline Einstein to thank that she would not repeat that negative word. You may hear negative words, and let me tell you something, that if people consistently come to you with negative ears, with negative words, there's something wrong with them and there's something wrong with you. Amen. It happens once in a while, but if it happens repeatedly, consistently, you've got a problem as well. Because they recognize you as a receiver. Amen. And you need to put a stop to it. And you're as much a part of the gossip and the criticism and the negativism as they are. And you stand before God in judgment if you do not change it. Say, listen, I don't want to hear that. That's my brother you're talking about. That's my sister you're talking about. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? You need to put your foot down and say, not in my life. You say, well, I don't want to lose their friendship. Is that the kind of friends you want? And you wonder why you battle depression? And you invite depressive thoughts and attitudes into your life? Hey, listen, I can only be around it for about a minute. And I'm about ready. I just feel, it's so demonic. It's like something crawling all over you. It's wicked. Some people are so totally comfortable with it. It's demonic. Amen. The word devil means slanderer. It means critic. He's the accuser of the brethren. And if you want to play his games, you go ahead. But we're not going to in this church. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? We're going to uplift. And if necessary, we'll correct. But we're going to do it lovingly. We're going to do it with with kindness, we're gonna do it with diplomacy, we're gonna do it with understanding, we're gonna do it gently, we're gonna do it at the right time and in the right way, amen? I do believe in correcting people. I'm not all fluffy or just make you feel good. You know that, you felt the gospel plow go deep. You felt God convict. Thank God for people like Pauline Einstein. She would not read that negative note. Because who knows if she had read that to him, that might have got embedded in his mind, impressed in his spirit. He might not have solved the theory of relativity. Say, I don't really think it matters a whole lot. Let me ask you a question. Do you think if we were to stand and pray for somebody tonight in British Columbia, Vancouver, a pastor that's struggling out there, do you think that God, it would make a difference whether he ever knew we said it or not? Do you think it would have made a difference in the spirit realm if we begin to pray for brother, I don't know, Carmichael or somebody, we'll just make up a name. Do you think it would make a difference? in the spiritual climate? Do you think that we can even affect things in, in Vancouver, British Columbia mm -hmm. by praying? Mm -hmm. What makes you think if you speak something that's <coughs> negative or critical or, 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 or nasty that it doesn't affect the spiritual world? And do you think that that's gonna bless you and lift your boat any higher? It's not gonna lift you up. It's not gonna lift anybody else up. And I'm just telling you something that Jesus Christ is in this place. And he hears every word that you and I say. And he said, by your words, you're going to be justified. And by your words, you're going to be condemned. Amen. Amen. And you know what? See these ears right here? These ears here are not garbage bins. Right. But if somebody came to me and, and they, had, they really felt like something needed to be changed or whatever, I'm going to listen, especially if I see them in the prayer room. I'm going to listen to them. Especially if I see them with their hands raised and see them connected with God. Especially if I see them smiling and greeting new people and that they're concerned. But if they're just a negative, unhappy person, do you think I'm going to pay a whole lot of attention? I'll be polite. I'll nod. I'll hear what you say. But I'm going to chalk it up that this is, this is not worth the source. It's not worth it. Is this good teaching? Tell me, I love you. I want you saved. And I've gone completely around Robin Hood's barn here. <laughs> but I believe we've heard from God. And now we need to pray about what we've heard. Amen. And I, I know, Sister Michael, your blessing. I'm not going to call you back right now, but maybe we will. 
She's recovering. She and her family were really sick. Amen. Really sick this last couple of weeks, but they're doing better. But her voice is not back. But do we need music to pray? Or could the word of God, as we stand together, I love you. I will do my best to preach in an enjoyable fashion so we can laugh once in a while. But right now, the Holy Ghost is convicting us. You know why? Because he wants to lift us. No condemnation. God's not condemning us. But some of you, your heart's pounding. You are under conviction of the Holy Ghost. You may be a spiritual leader, but spiritual leaders can get sidetracked. We can get negative. It can happen. You don't realize. You start sliding. But I love you and I want to see you make it. Amen. Amen. And God's about to give us a great revival. Yes, sir. And a harvest. Amen. The revival will come within us. Amen. And the harvest will come from out there. Yes, sir. And God will use your love and kindness and wisdom and your testimony Amen. and mine. Amen. Amen. I want to invite people out to church, but I want to know that this is a loving, non critical atmosphere. Because why would I bring anybody in here to receive? What some of you have received. Why would I want to do that? You know, they go out and they tell 10 people, at least, who tell 10 other people. These two couple of people that we met, we didn't solicit the conversations. The people opened up. And maybe this week I'll find three people that said, I've been watching service online. I like what I feel. I'm going to come out. And I'll share that with you. But for today, that's where we stand. We're two out of two. And the two comments that we heard from the community were negative. And I honestly see where there's work to be done. But I also see so much promise, so much potential. We can be better. We can do better. We can love better. We can be greater. But we're going to do it on our knees. And we're going to do it as God changes us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And if God is... I know he's talking to us. Because he's talking to me. I need to improve. I do. I'm praying every day. God help me. Help me to be Amen. the pastor you want me to be. Help me to be the leader. Help me to be the Christian. Help me to be the husband, Lord. Help me to be the dad that I need to be. Help me to be the neighbor. We've had such wonderful contact with neighbors. Amen. People have been so kind. Amen. And I'm just looking for an opportunity to invite some people out. But I just want to know that it's going to be safe. Because let me say, if it's not safe for me, why would I bring them in? Why would I do that? That'd be stupid of me. It's got to be safe here. There's a lot of healing needs to take place in our hearts and lives. Some of you need to be healed of loneliness. Some of you need to be healed of depression. Some of you need to be healed of hurts from the past. Amen. I'm just going to open up this altar. I just want you to come. I just want you to pray. I want you to pray that God will help us because we're wasting his time. We're racing the rapture. Let's come. So, uh, as I'm rambling here, I promise you I won't talk for long because we're going to go to God in prayer. Amen. But I'm serious, saints of God. There's such a need. It's a broken, it's a broken town. It's a hurting town. And you and I hold the key. We hold the answer. Your life can be so powerful. Your life can have such an influence. God can use you in a mighty way. 
If we just hear the voice of the Spirit and surrender to God tonight. I don't know what he's dealing with you on. I know what he's dealing with me. But I want to be better for the kingdom of God. I know we've got it in us. I know that God's going to help us. Let's just lift our voices and begin to pray together. Hallelujah, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Lord, I love your people. I love this place, oh God. I love, oh God, you are doing I want you to work in my life, oh God, and I don't look at anybody else, Lord. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. God, I want my life to be more effective. I want it to be fruitful. I want to have an impact, oh God, on souls to come to you. Oh God, if I keep on doing things all the same, Lord, I'll just keep getting the same result. But God, I'm willing to change. I'm willing, oh God, to do some things differently, Lord. I'm willing, oh God, to let you just revolutionize my life in any way that you need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh God, I don't want to be part of hurt. I want to be a part of helping. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, bless me. I pray that you anoint me. You have powerful anointing to settle me into this place, oh God. I pray, Lord Jesus, you would teach us how to pray and pray to bear prayer. Prayers, oh God, of surrender. Prayers of humility, oh God. Prayers, oh God, that are born out of the love of God. Prayers, oh God, that the Lord is spirit intercedes your us, Lord Jesus. Amen. Oh God, I pray that no sister precious to you, Lord, have been that within the last couple of days, oh God. That didn't feel accepted, oh Lord. God, I didn't recognize them, Lord. If anybody I'd ever seen, I don't know what the story is. And I don't even know. I just pray, oh God, that you would touch their heart. And that the next time that I see them, Lord, my wife sees them, that the Lord, they will, will have come a little closer, Lord, to you. And that God, you would give us influence with them. God, give us influence, I pray. In the name of Jesus, I pray, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh Lord, help us to come. Your love of Shandara, your love of I love you, O oh God. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my will to you, Lord. I want you to be in charge. I want you to be in control. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. That you would be seen in my life. That you would be seen in my heart. That you'd be seen in my life. Oh God. Your presence, your love. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. My Jesus. I love you, Lord. 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 I love you, Jesus. 